Well, thanks everyone for worshiping with us online. I hope, I know it's a little weird, I know it's a little different, but I hope that you sing along where you are. Um, there's something different about just being a participator uh, in worship as opposed to a spectator. There's something about engaging our heart in praising God that transforms us. And I know it can be a little bit awkward standing there in your living room all by yourself, but I just encourage you to get over that. Put that aside and find a way. Push through. Praise God for yourself. Don't just listen to us. We get all the benefits up here praising with each other. We want you to be blessed as well. And you're going to be blessed by engaging in praise and worship. So I want to encourage that. If you missed the opportunity, you didn't push yourself out there in praise and worship. When this is done, pause it and replay. And get on your feet and worship God and give him glory. Recognize who he is with your own mouth. Sometimes we need to be reminded with our own mouth, we need to hear ourselves say it, that he is good and that he's worthy of praise. So I'd encourage you to do that. Thank you to those of you who did sing out loud and raise your hand and turn your heart toward heaven today to recognize the goodness of God because it changes us. God is worthy of praise, but you know what? Praise changes us. And I don't know about you, but I need to be changed all the time. I need to be changed and refocused. So let that be something that encourages you today to engage in praising God. Well, I have to confess, I lied to you. I didn't mean to lie to you, but last week I told you it was week three of a three-part series in times like these. I lied because this week I'm going to talk to you about in times like these again. Something kept coming up to me and I had an idea for what I felt like I needed to share with you and encourage you with and remind you of. And and I kept hearing the phrase, in times like these, in times like these, and the way it all came together, it seemed like it was wrapping up the series. So this is, I guess, week four of four, in times like these. And I called it, in times like these, grace, period. In times like these, grace. Right now, a lot of us are anticipating a huge shift in our lives. If you are a teacher, if you are a student, if you are an educational assistant, if you are a coach, if you are in education in any way, shape, or form, um, there is a big shift right now called back to school. And there's always anticipation about the back-to-school shift. Um, However, this year, it's a little different. This year, there's a little more angst accompanying the beginning of the year. This year, there's a little more uncertainty as we approach the summer's end. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say it out loud. We are approaching the summer's end and the shift into fall and shift into a new schedule and shift into a new normal and a new routine. Things are shifting. And when that happens, for many of us, our sense of anxiety goes on the rise. Our worry is on the rise. Protocols are changing constantly as the situation with COVID-19 changes. I've heard of parents opting to pull kids out of school and homeschool this year when maybe they weren't in the past. Um, A lot of parents are excited to send their kids off to school, but they also have that hesitance, like, is everything going to be okay? And many that are not feeling okay about going back to school. Many students are going to have to wear masks. I'm sure many teachers will be be wearing masks. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of micromanaging and a lot of protocols to stay on top of. There are things that are going to be different. For many of you, it means, okay, the kids are now in school, and so my work life returns to something more normal. For most of us, there's a shift, and maybe your life isn't shifting, but maybe your grandchildren's lives are shifting, and your children's lives are shifting. Several months ago, it was probably more of a minority that suffered with anxiety, that had a a level of constant worry, a level of losing sleep, seeking help, therapies, medication. And I know for sure that those levels of anxiety and the numbers of people suffering with it, with feeling hopeless, with depression, has certainly gone up. 
And so some of you may be feeling sensitive because of health risks. Some of you are feeling anxious because of just the uncertainty and the unknowns that lay ahead. Some of you um, feel like masks is the way to go. If we all wear masks all the time, things will be better. And some of you are frustrated because you don't want to wear masks and you think it's silly. Some of you are still limiting your exposure to people as much as you can. You're limiting those, you're limiting those physical interactions and it's funny how hugs, which were something that most people welcomed pre-COVID, many people now would criticize. Some are very sensitive to having not seen friends for a long time, not seeing maybe family for a long time, not seeing coworkers anymore as you're working at home. There have been many costs, but I know one thing is that whether you're frustrated by the inconveniences and whether you're frustrated because you're afraid, there have been limits and inconveniences to us all. And I think many of us would love it if things just went back to what we would call normal, if that were possible. And in times like these, most of us are either anxious or shamed. Many of us are anxious, and some, of, some people might say, well, people who are anxious just need to have a little faith. They just need to have faith, faith that God's going to keep them, faith that they're not going to get sick, faith that everything's going to be okay. And some who are bold, some who are not afraid, have been shamed because they're being bold, because they're not um, afraid, because they're maybe taking risks that other people think are foolish. The bold might be criticized and told that they need to have more compassion for others around them, or more prudence. So just a couple things. For my friends who are battling anxiety, know this. We've been praying for you. We've been praying for you, for our church community, for our world, because we know anxiety is a huge thing right now, especially as we prepare for another shift, and especially as in Manitoba, here where we are, numbers are rising. So for those of you battling anxiety, battling worry, battling frustration, It's time to put trust in motion. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your old understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will keep your paths straight. It's time to put that trust, every bit of faith that you have, every bit of trust that you have in the Lord, it's time to utilize it. It's time to put it in motion. And that's a lot easier said than done, I know. Do all you can For those of you who are feeling anxious, do everything that you can. Plan, prepare, prevent, but then there comes a time that you need to let go. For those of you who are feeling anxious, I would say this, be Martha from the Bible, the one who is working and preparing and getting everything ready for her guests. Do all you can do like Martha. Get everything ready, work hard, prepare like Martha. But at some point, like we talked about last week, we have to learn to let go, like Mary, and be, and find that place of rest. For those of you who are battling anxiety in this season, as things shift in the next week or two, breathe deeply. Take time to thank God for what you have. See, often worry and often anxiety is anticipating what we don't have or what we could lose, what might happen, all the bad things that might happen. And one of the ways that we can counteract that a little bit is to focus on what we do have, what we have to be thankful for, gratitude. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7 in the NIV says, Do not be anxious about anything, Lord have mercy. But in every situation... Every situation, that means no matter how traumatic, no matter how terrible, no matter how difficult, in every situation by prayer and petition, so through prayer, by giving it to God, by venting to him, with thanksgiving, so there's that thankful part where we're going to fix our attention, present your requests to God. So why would presenting requests to God with thanksgiving help me not be anxious? Because we're taking our concerns and we're, we're giving them to him and we're saying, okay, hey God, I trust you. 
I'm going to tell you about what's making me anxious, and I'm, I'm just going to trust that you're going to deal with it. Whether you say yes, whether you say not right now, later, whether you say no, I'm just, I'm going to give it to you, and I'm going to trust that you're going to deal with it. It's trust. So do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I know of someone going through something right now, and and this is exactly what's happening. The peace of God, which transcends our understanding, it's beyond what we can even comprehend, is guarding that heart and that mind in Christ Jesus. When, when every indication should be that that person is so anxious and worried about the uncertainty and the difficulty ahead, there's just peace. Because there's gratitude for today, not worrying about tomorrow. For those of you who are anxious, live in the moment. Live in today. Live in now with your gratitude. The Bible says tomorrow has worries enough of its own. Don't worry about tomorrow. We don't know what's going to go with tomorrow, and it's going to come with its own worries. Just look at today. Deal with today, and look for what you can be thankful for. 1 Peter 3.11 in the Amplified says this, For the one who wants to enjoy life and see good days. Must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile. He must turn away from wickedness and do what is right. He must search for peace. And then the Amplified puts in here, peace with God, with self, with others. And pursue it eagerly, actively, not just desiring it. See, anxiety will rob you of your peace. Worries will absolutely steal your peace. And if you have no peace, you will have no joy. You will be filled with tension and turmoil. But we can pursue peace eagerly, not just desiring it. We can go after it. To those of you who are bold and unafraid and you are finding yourself in a place of peace, you're finding yourself in a place of faith, it can be frustrating to see so many worried and anxious. And it's going to take extra grace for you. But don't be shamed. Don't allow yourself to be shamed. Don't allow people to tell you, you should be afraid. What's the matter with you? Why aren't you being more careful here? Why aren't you doing this? Don't be shamed and cower and hide your confidence. We need it. We need your smile. We need you to let your ease penetrate through the tension that is all around us. Proverbs 12, 25 said, says, anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. Those of you who you feel the presence of God and the peace of God guarding your heart and mind, we need you to have that kind word, to have that humor at the right time, that'll cut through that tension and the anxiety that's weighing down the hearts of the people all around us. To those of you who are bold and unafraid in this season, be sensitive. Sometimes it's easy to be selfish in our boldness and in our fearlessness, and it's easy to discount and discredit what other people are going through. We need to have grace, and that looks like having compassion and being sacrificial, and in this season, it may, it may mean like, it may look like taking precautions that you don't feel are necessary personally. It may look like doing for others what you know they need and putting their needs above your own. In times like these, more than ever, we see the lines that divide us. This is really the thought that prompted me to to speak to you about this is because everywhere I look, I see lines dividing people. People feeling like other people aren't taking things seriously. How could they be like that? You see the criticisms come up. We're seeing criticisms in politics everywhere, criticizing our leaders for this action or for this inaction, for this spending or this lack of spending. Criticism after criticism because we see these lines and we have this natural tendency to separate ourselves from people who think differently than us. We have this natural tendency 
to want to push them away. We, I don't know about you, but I, I have felt myself get pulled into that gross cycle of criticism, especially when you see it on social media. You see those opinions flying around so strongly. We have to be careful of criticism. I have a little joke. Why are sound guys so bad at taking criticism? They hate feedback. <laughs> we don't like feedback, do we? We don't like it when people have something to say about the position we take. And that's the thing that's happening right now. People are taking positions about everything. And it's so in your face right now. It's everywhere. And we can get really critical too. And what is that? What is that when we're all getting critical? It's pride. Because at the heart of it, it's we're taking a position and we think we're right. And if we're right, then you have to be wrong. And it's pride. And we become judgmental. And we become condescending. And I think probably all of us have been guilty of that lately. Unless we've been pretty aware and careful about it. James 5, 9 in the NLT says, Don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged for look. The judge is standing at the door. We have to be so careful about grumbling against people because we tend to take a position assuming we understand what life looks like through their eyes. Only God knows what life looks like through their eyes. We have to be very careful about being critical of others. Lines divide us about politics, policies, our views on education, what they're doing and what they're not. Vaccines, medications, gathering. When are we coming back to church in person? How are they going to do that? They're doing it too soon. They're not doing it soon enough. They're having too many people. They're not letting enough of us in. You can't win. And it's easy to criticize people who think differently. So here's a question for you. Do you have people in your life that think differently than you? Do you have people in your life that you can dialogue with? Maybe it even makes you uncomfortable that you're dialoguing with it. Maybe your political views are very juxtaposed. It can be tense, but it's probably good for you. It keeps you on your toes. And it probably keeps you a little more humble than if they weren't in your life. Because in times like these, we can easily surround ourselves with people who think exactly like us. And here's the problem. Our, our egos love it when we're surrounded by people who validate our position. When we're surrounded by people who validate our opinions. And we need to be extra careful that we don't fall into the trap of condescending towards others when we feel like they're not handling things the way they should. We need to watch our thoughts. And we need to watch our speech and have a disposition of humility and not pride. Pride will easily lead us into the sins of gossip and slander and idle speech. The Bible has a lot to say about our speech, has a lot to say about slander, and it has a lot to say about gossip and idle speech. And we need to be careful. So here's some definitions for you. Slander is defined as making false and damaging statements about someone uh, other words would be like defamation and backbiting. And I, I'm going to expect that most of you are not doing this. I'm going to expect that most of you are probably not on purpose making false and damaging statements about people. Here's what gossip means. Gossip is a little bit more tricky. Gossip is defined as casual or unconstrained conversations or reports about other people, typically involving details that are not confirmed as being true. In other words, kind of just whispering, rumors, spreading the juicy stuff. Proverbs 26, 20 to 22 says, Without wood, a fire goes out, and without gossip, a quarrel dies down. And as charcoal to embers, and as wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome person for kindling strife. The words of a gossip are like choice, choice morsels. They go down to the inmost parts. Slander, not committing slander, is kind of a low bar. You know, 
don't say things that aren't true that hurt someone's reputation. I think probably most of, our, most of us aren't doing that. But what about gossip? What about spreading things that are juicy? Being critical and, and just um, putting those things out there to let people know we're not pleased. Mark seven twenty to 23 in the NIV says this. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. The evils that come from inside. Things like being super critical stirring up tensions, gossiping. We want to make sure that we're not allowing ourselves to become gross and just to drive the point a little bit farther home. James 1.26 is this. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Ouch. If you feel like, oh Lord, have mercy. (laughs) Have mercy, Jesus. I need to do a better job keeping a tight rein on my tongue. You can type in the chat, have mercy, Jesus. Because I know that we've all been there. I know that we can all do better on that. I know that in times like these, when we see people doing things differently than we want to see them do, it's easy to be critical, and it's easy to gossip, and it's easy to be judgmental and put our opinions out there because we think we're right, looking at life from our side of the fence. And it is such a slippery slope when we look on Facebook and we look on Instagram and we see what people are posting to judge them, to be critical, to gossip. But those of us who want to follow Jesus, those of us who consider ourselves religious, faith-filled Jesus followers, if we don't keep a tight rain on our tongue, if we're not being careful what we're saying, we deceive ourselves and our religion is worthless. It reminds me of that scripture in um, 1 Corinthians 13 that says, if you have tongues of men and angels, if you speak all kinds of amazing things, if you, if you do these wonderful religious things, it gives a big list, but, but if you don't have love, It's worth nothing. It reminds me of this verse. If we go around just not being careful what we're saying, our faith is worthless. Have mercy, Jesus. So we don't want to slander. We don't want to gossip. We don't want to be critical. We don't want to condescend. We don't want to be judgmental. What do we do? And this is not something that I feel like is really commonly talked about in our culture. It is not something that I feel like in North American culture we do really well. There are some cultures in the world that do this really well. In times like these, choose honor. In times like these, choose honor. It's hard right now sometimes to know who to trust. (laughs) We feel like, I feel like sometimes I'm sifting through information and and trying to discern what is what in order to make a good decision. And that's especially true with news and social media. You're constantly trying to judge what you're hearing. Is that true? Fact checking. It's hard to know who to trust. It's hard to know what to listen to. And let's face it, social media and even regular media is not prone to showing honor. It's something that, as people of God, we need to choose to do. And it's going to take some intentionality because our culture isn't setting a super great example. Ephesians 4, 29 says this. This is where the bar gets raised a little higher. 
Ephesians 4.29 says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Building others up. It doesn't mean there's no place for criticism, but you've all heard of constructive criticism. Criticism that's put there to make someone better, not to tear them down. Our job as Christ followers is to look for opportunities to say things that are going to encourage, say things that are going to build people up, even those who we don't agree with. 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17 says this, and I think this is really important for us right now in this current time, in times like these. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, government, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or the governor as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free. Don't be ashamed of not being fearful. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil. So consider others. But living as servants of God. Now, here's, here it is. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. And honor the emperor. I believe in times like these, this is insight. How we should be conducting ourselves as followers of God. So what is honor? Honor is defined as just high respect, having great esteem, consider, considering others even as better than yourselves and showing them that. Honor everyone. Greatly esteem people. Regard them with respect. Assign value to them. As humanity, we are image bearers of God and we need to assign esteem and value to people. Honor them not tearing them down, not criticizing them, certainly not to tear them down. If there's any criticism or judgment, it should be for the purpose of building up. And in order to honor someone, it is not a prerequisite to agree with them. You can still value them and esteem them, even if you completely, fundamentally disagree with them about something. Number two, love the brotherhood. Those who love God, they're our family. God is our father. We are family of God. Take care of those you can take care of. Watch out for those you can watch out for. Encourage people to take, to keep faith. Say what you can to build them up. Encourage them to trust Jesus in the middle of all the certainty and not to lose hope that there are better days ahead. Number three was fear God. Fear God. Respect him. Be in awe of him. Keep him at the center of your life. Keep him at the center of your day. Keep him at the forefront of your heart and your mind and your decision making. Being aware of his presence. And finally, honor the emperor. We don't have an emperor. We have a prime minister. We have MLAs. We have MPs. We have people in government. And to be honest, in times like these, it's, it's hard to be a leader. In times like these, it's, it's a little bit rough going. Our leaders are making decisions right now that probably half of the people that they lead disagree with. That's not a fun place to be. And the more a decision affects your life, and the more you don't like a decision that your leaders make, the easier it is to be critical. The easier it is to dishonor them. Dave Martin says, you learn about the character of a person when you don't give them what they want. You learn about the character of a person when you don't give them what they want. Right now, I feel like many of us don't know what we want. We want life to go back to normal. We want freedom, but we want the government to protect us. We, we want to be protected, but we want freedom. Maybe you're a boss, maybe you're a manager, maybe you're a, a CEO, maybe you're a principal, maybe you're an MLA, and you're dealing with all kinds of criticism and people talking about you and tearing you down. Maybe they're saying you're too conservative, you're too fearful, you're not spending enough money, you're not spending money in the right places, you're spending too much money. 
You're not taking enough precautionary measures. You're being too risky. Can you just keep going? It goes on and on and on and on. I would encourage you, just keep going. One foot in front of the other. And like we say a lot around here, just make the next right decision. So whether you agree or disagree, people in leadership are appointed. And that should comfort us. Romans 13.1 says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, granted by his permission and sanction. And those which exist have been put in place by God. We need to understand that a lot of leaders right now are in a difficult position. And in times like these, what does that mean for us? It means we need to pray for our leaders. Especially those ones who might be making decisions we don't like. Maybe they think different. Maybe they feel different. Luke 6.27 says, But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. You may be in a position where people are making decisions that are affecting your life and it's making you angry and you feel helpless because you don't have the power to change it. Pray for those who hurt you. Bless those who curse you. In other words, grace. In times like these, grace. We all need grace. We need grace for ourselves because we have found ourselves gossiping and criticizing and being judgmental and being condescending towards people who think differently than us, maybe people who are more anxious than us or people who are more free and fearless than us, and we don't like how that looks and feels. We don't want them to be around us. We don't want it to rub off on us. We need grace for all the times we've been selfish and inconsiderate of others. We need grace for all those times we've put our own needs above the needs of others. We need grace for all the times we've been anxious and we haven't let go. We haven't found a way to let go and pursue peace eagerly. We need to extend grace to those who slander us, who criticize us, who gossip about us. We need to pray for grace for our leaders to endure under what they are going through. Grace to help them make good decisions. And we all need grace to keep faith and hope alive in times that are tough. When asked, um, when, when Paul asked God to remove the thorn of his flesh, some sort of physical problem that he had, Paul heard God answer him, my grace is sufficient for you. And that is the word from the Lord to you and me today, I believe. My grace is sufficient for you. No matter where you find yourself, whether you find yourself being a leader, whether you find yourself being criticized, whether you find yourself anxious, wherever you find yourself, hear the word of the Lord. My grace is sufficient for you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would help us to apply your word to our lives. These these concepts that anxiety is not something that you desire for us. It's, It's our natural inclination when things are uncertain. It's our natural inclination when we are concerned. It's our nature. But God, we... We want a supernature. We believe in the supernatural. You are a supernatural God. You supersede our nature. And we need you. We need you to help us, those of us who are struggling with anxiety and worry and fear, especially in this transition into another stage of new normal. We need you. We need your grace. And we believe that it is sufficient for us in this moment. For those of us who've been critical and judgmental, maybe gossiping. Lord, we need your grace. We need your forgiveness. We ask for your forgiveness. And we we need your grace to help us. Help us not to be critical. Help us not to be judgmental. Help us to extend grace to those who are different than us. So the world can see something different. 
when the world is condescending and judging and there's just opinions flying around everywhere. Lord, help us to be different. Help us to love those who are not like us, who see things differently than we do. And we ask that you help us to honor people. Help us to honor humanity who is made in your image. Help us to love our family of believers. Help us to take care of our family believers in this season. Help us to esteem our leaders and remember to pray for our leaders and all those that you would bring to our minds. We pray Psalm 141 verse 3 that says, set a guard over my mouth, Lord, and keep watch over the door of my lips. That all that is spoken, all that is said, and even all that is thought that would be pleasing to you, but Lord, it would not tear down, but rather it would be used to build up all of those who may hear it. We thank you for hearing our prayer. We thank you for being ever present in the time of trouble. We honor you. We are in awe of your greatness and your goodness and your presence in our lives. You are a very present help in time of trouble. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.